Mr. Ulrich, you represent the appellee. Ms. Schoen, you are the appellant pro se. You signed in under Margaret Ringel Baker. Is that what you prefer to be called as? You're on mute. You have to unmute your microphone. All right. Go by Margaret Ringel Baker. Um, okay. If you don't mind sending, too many. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever name you want is fine with us, but you, the the sheet is listed as Margaret Baker shown uh, of your that brief. Means. So if you send in a little notice, the clerk can make that correction for you. Okay. All I right. could always. Thank you. So you have 20 minutes. You, I don't know if you heard the beginning and you can take up to five minutes for rebuttal. Would you like to reserve rebuttal time? I would. Five minutes? That would be all, fine. All right, let's begin. And if I might respectfully begin with your permission to read from my prepared statement. Um, my intention is to stay on point and clarity and I have timed my words to be probably only about seven minutes. You got, um, five, you got 15 minutes, you can read. Dance with it, however you want to proceed is fine. Thank you very much. Um, I come to you today to have this matter remanded to the lower civil court, which denied my motion to consolidate two cases in the lower courts with same subject matter, same parties and same issues and to avoid inconsistent rulings. This was done despite precedent court protocol and the current status of the law regarding consolidation of cases when requested by a party. I seek the assistance of the lower probate court to enforce its code as to the appellee's non-compliance with a mandatory requirement of the probate code 5401D or the state statute 733-609. In the cases I seek to consolidate, there were inconsistent actions uh, required because of inconsistent orders made on inconsistent facts presented and ignored. I cannot do that if all orders and pleadings are not consolidated so, so that the probate court can modify and or rescind orders not consistent with the code. There were no waivers of any sort to release the appellee um, of her responsibility to, prov to provide specific and detailed accounting for every dollar she sought for reimbursement. Appellee never did that. The aggregate of any and all her claims made in writing to either courts never totaled as much as even $50,000. There was no established basis for her claim against the estate to reimburse her for $200,000. Originally, this matter was not complicated and resolution was simple. If only the trust, the trust amendment made in 1996 and the last will and testament of our father were followed, there would not have been this eight years of litigation. But Mr. Ulrich argues I'm suffering from buyer's remorse. Not true. My earnest inquiries of, a, of the appellee to provide information to substantiate her demands for the $200,000 made in personal correspondence to my sister, emails and between the attorneys and in documents filed by my attorney in both lower courts were ignored. For the last 30 years of my father's life, my contributions to the house, <clears throat> its design, its construction, its mortgage, its taxes, the maintenance, as well as expenses for the care of my father re reported in an exhale spreadsheet. Expenses totaled $307,000. After the forced sale of the home and so-called urgent sale of the property, I received only 179,000. On June 29th in 2013, two, man two months after my father passed, I made an offer to my sister to buy her interest in the house based on the current, at that time, appraised value of 740,000. So it was my understanding that we had a year after father's death, death to pay off a reverse mortgage originally held by Champion. This offer would have stayed any collection action, including the sale of the house by them. My sister took no action of my offer, but she did acknowledge its receipt. So the appellee went into civil court to get declaratory relief to allow her to sell the house, to pay off her reverse mortgage now due to Palmer Capital that she had renegotiated without benefit of my knowledge or, or support. And I believe she specifically kept me ignorant about the substantial borrowed amount borrowed that now had to be repaid. 
she then would not have to justify the expenses in the civil court. In a world where there's familial respect and affection and personal suffering and circumstances are made known, it's presumed consideration will be offered by the unaffected member to the one afflicted. The appellee ignored my circumstances and ignored my parents' written intentions as stated in the terms of a trust agreement, an amendment to the terms of the agreement and to that trust in the last will and testament of our father. My sister had accepted my, my sister accepted my offer to reimburse half of a balance of a reverse mortgage for the expenses incurred during her term as a person of power of attorney for my father and as the personal representative for the trust. She agreed likewise to pay her share. I believe my sister could not afford to keep her promise to pay one half of the reverse mortgage in June of 2013. I believe the refinance of this reverse mortgage included disbursements of money made to enrich her personally. I failed to honor the purchase of the home within a time frame given due to a circumstance beyond my control. My husband suffering from Alzheimer's emptied our bank accounts. He had no memory of how or where the money went and we went broke. When I became financially stable and renewed my offer, the appellee denied me the opportunity. I'm accused of non-compliance of fulfilling the terms of a settlement agreement for which appellee failed to justify the basement basis for her demands. The appellee failed to comply with the probate code to provide a truthful and complete final and strict accounting. My sister's actions have taken from me my entire investment in a house I, as an architect by profession, designed, built, upgraded ongoingly as health issues dominated my father's life. I anticipated a home modified already to meet the physical needs of my husband, disabled with Alzheimer's when we retired. Appelli, who failed in her fiduciary duties and violated my father's trust, must bear some consequence for her actions and be called to answer. The Pelly must make restitution for my loss upon the discovery of any fraud or perjury or accounting mistakes. I seek parity. I seek to be, be made whole for any diminished value in my beneficiary interest in the property sale, including failure of any consideration for the monies I advanced and for any monies received by a Pelly for which she was not entitled. There is the letter of the law to be honored, which I know Mr. Ulrich to be much better situated than I to argue before this court. But there is the spirit of the law. Equitable action can be taken equitable relief could be made possible by this court if this court grants my, the relief I seek. As a query to the posted by the court as to this matter being moot as my action in a 2D1942 case was dismissed, I will offer this. There was no petition for specific relief was made of this court as I failed to file an initial brief due to the lack of physical material and legal resources I suffered caused by the pandemic. No claims were made regarding the damage I suffered or were the breach of duties and possible criminal actions of the appellee made known to the court. I filed this appeal when all options in the lower court for relief were denied me. Therefore, I request the court to hear my motion and grant me the relief I seek today. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. You have five minutes for your rebuttal. Mr. Ulrich. You're on mute. Mr. Ulrich. You're on mute. You're on mute. Your mic on your computer. There's a mute button you got to hit. I'm very sorry, Your Honor. That's all right. Proceed. Uh, Christopher Ulrich, I represent Catherine Riegler in her individual capacity and as personal representative of the state of her father and and appellant's father, Charles W. Ringel, and as trustee of his trust as well. Your Honors, I was prepared to start um, and, and address the court's inquiry with respect to mootness, but in hearing uh, appellant's statement, I, I just need, feel the need to say that, um, you know, it's the, this litigation has been going on for almost eight years now. 
And we've had all kinds of motion practice. We've had all kinds of appearances before the court. We've had all kinds of disputes and, and we've had settlements. But I have never heard, and it's not one word in the record, of most of what appellant has just described to the court. Uh, it was never offered as a reason for failure to grant any order that has been entered. It has never been offered as, a, as a, an impact on the, on the case in any fashion. Um, so I am a little bit troubled by the fact that so much of what was just said has nothing to do with the record on, on this case. If, if you turn to mootness and, and uh, you examine it, uh, I think the answer has to be that this appeal is moot. Um, both the, this court and the Florida Supreme Court have said that when, when a controversy has been so fully resolved that a judicial determination can have no actual effect, it's moot. Now, or in other words, when there's no practical result could occur. That's what we have here. Here on appeal, Ms. Baker shown, I'm sorry, Ms. now Ms. Baker Riegler shown, uh, seeks an order to consolidate the, appellate ca the uh, probate case with the trust case, with this case. However, the probate case was dismissed by this court. Its appeal was terminated. There is no pending uh, case in the trial court. The estate is done. There was an accounting filed in the probate court. That was done in spite of what appellant says. That case is over with and has now been over with for months, not years. And, uh, and so there, sim the simple matter is there being nothing to consolidate this case with, there can be no consolidation. It must be moot. There's, there's, there's just nothing else that can happen. There's no litigation going on in the probate court to consolidate this case with. Now, admittedly, that's a, that's a rather simple, simple argument, but I think it's dispositive. You can't have consolidation where there's only one case pending. So, so and, if, and if you go further, you will see, and you look at the circumstances surrounding this case, there's even more reason to think that this, this situation is moot. Here, the case- well, We have jurisdiction to determine, I mean, even, are you saying, the, are you conflating the merits of the decision not to consolidate with, um, the jurisdiction to make that determination. In other words, if the trial court had, had a motion to consolidate in front of him and said, well, the reason is because the other case is no more. And then we have jurisdiction to determine whether that was correct based on the merits, which was because the other case was no more. Um, isn't that just you, what you're arguing is going to the merits as, a going, as opposed to going to our jurisdiction? Well, Your Honor, I, I, think, I think this court has jurisdiction right now to resolve this appeal, which is should the motion to consolidate have been granted? Should it have been denied? Or is the issue moot? All right. I, I don't think this court has, has at this point in time a decision to make with respect to the existence of the probate case. Okay, so 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 the, the logic still exists. There is no probate case, there is no probate appeal, there's nothing there. And you can't you can't consolidate where you only have one case. I just don't see how it can be done. And, and my, my further argument with respect to mootness is that if you look at the sort of the procedural history of this case, there's really nothing here either. This case was first settled in May of 2016. It was ultimately dismissed by the court with prejudice, reserving only the right to enforce the media, mediation settlement agreement in 2017. No appeal was taken. There, were enforcement, there was enforcement litigation that occurred thereafter. And in 2018, it was dismissed again because the parties for the second time settled their case. And in each of those settlements, appellant waived her right, her claims, released uh, the, the estate, the trust. And so she has no claims left. So there's not, even if it were to consolidate, she would have no claims to assert. She's released the, the estate, she's released the trust. The, the, the trust case has been over on, at the trial level for, for years. So, so there really is nothing here anymore. And so I think that, that it comes up in this context because no appeal was ever taken of the trust case. And, and, and if you look at the order that was entered by Judge Kyle in the trial court, he goes out of his way to describe the, the sort of the, the lengthy process 
by which the case proceeded. And, and, at the, and when the final order entered after the mediated settlement agreement and the enforcement actions that were done then and how the second settlement occurred, he goes through all of that. It's a, it's a reasoned decision based on the fact that the case is over. And at the end of his order, he says very clearly, the final order in this case, basically it's the 2017 order that I entered way back when. And, and that, is, that is the final order in this case. And there's, there's, nothing, you know, there's nothing here. So I think for those reasons, Your Honor, this case is, is moot. There's nothing on the probate side. There's nothing on the trust side. There's nothing to litigate. No party has, a, has the right to a trial. No party has, has litigation pending. There's no motion practice pending. There's no discovery pending. There's nothing out there. So the appeal should be rendered moot. It should be, should be adjudicated to be moot. Now, if, if you'd even, I would say this too, even if you do reach, you say, okay, that's fine, but we don't think it's moot. Now, I think that I would disagree, but I understand. So, so if you, even if you go down the road a ways and say, okay, should Judge Kyle have, have, have consolidated the cases? Well, appellant in her brief, her reply brief, I believe it is, lists five factors that she thinks courts consider when, uh, when they decide whether or not a case uh, should be consolidated. And quite frankly, if you, if you look at the cases, you find that the courts generally say consolidation is primarily for judicial resources. We wanna protect judicial resources, give the courts an opportunity to sort of consolidate things and make their work less. So, so the bulk of the factors that appellant cites relate to, uh, relate to judicial resources and whether or not cases should be, will there be an advantage if they were put together? Whether a trial, the trial process would be accelerated, whether unnecessary costs and delays can be avoided, whether there's a possibility of inconsistent verdicts, whether consolidation would eliminate the need for duplicative trials. Now, all of those, I think, can be analyzed in the context of this case at the same time and in the same way. There's no trials out there. There's no costs out there except coming from this appeal. There's nothing to be saved by consolidation. If you were to consolidate two cases, you'd be essentially consolidating two empty shells because there's nothing there that's going to, that's going to be affected. Now, the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that the last, the last consideration that she, that appellant puts in her brief uh, is that there's, there is, um, whether consolidation will deprive a party of sub, a substantive right. And that's sort of the defensive side, right? That's the side that says, is there a reason we shouldn't consolidate? Now, interestingly, because there's no litigation here, you can say, okay, there's no reason to do it. There's also no reason not to do it. Well, I would say this about that. Consolidation would deprive Ms. Riegler, who has been carrying this thing just in the same manner as appellant has, you know, just day in, day out, carrying this thing for all these years, it would deprive her to have a right at this point in time to have the case over with, that the estate of her father is done. Let's have the court recognize that fact. The trust matter is done. Let's have the court recognize that fact. Let's put this to bed. It has been going on and bleeding and going on for all these years. And that is a substantive right that would be lost if this were consolidated. Now, I would say that if you go dig deeper into uh, the briefs, you'll see that much of the disagreement or much of the controversy raised by appellant in this matter relates to her assessment of homes, Florida homestead law, and in particular, the homestead order issued by the probate court. While I don't think it's central to the court's decision on mootness or consolidation, I do think since it, it takes so much of a part of the briefing, that appellant did in this matter, that it should be addressed and clarified a little bit. When Mr. Ringel died, he owned half of the property outright in his own name. And that, and, uh, and under his will, that, that half interest was transferred to his trust. The trust held the other half interest. As is customary with homestead property, Ms. Riegler, as personal representative, petitioned the probate court for a homestead order. Now, the, the appellant did, appellant, the appellant's counsel did not object to that petition. The probate court entered the homestead order, and the probate court found that the property was Mr. Ringel's homestead property, and that because he died without leaving a spouse or minor child, 
there was a valid disposition of the property into the trust with full power and authority pursuant to Florida Statute 689-071 to protect, conserve, sell, lease, encumber, or otherwise manage and dispose of the property. That was a valid devise. The courts of, of this state have, have long held that while there is no surviving spouse or no minor child, the Seton's homestead may be devised without limitation. So that's what was done. And it was put into the trust. So far from saying the court didn't have jurisdiction as Ms. Ringel says, or Ms. Baker, Ms. Baker Ringel Sean, I apologize, says the, the, the homestead order gave the, the trial court in the, in the trust case, the jurisdiction. It's, a, it's validly in the trust. You trust, trust court, you court litigating in trust matter have jurisdiction over this matter. And you have full authority to handle it under the Florida trust code. And that's what was done. Since there are no restrictions on Mr. Ringel's ability to devise the property, it could have been devised to anyone. Similarly, because the property was freely devisable, there were no restrictions on the trust. So the trust held the property. As part of its order, the probate court also directed that the personal representative surrender the homestead property, not to Ms. Riegler and Ms. Baker Ringel shown as she asserts in her brief, but to the trustee in accordance with the disposition made by Mr. Ringel in his, in his estate plan. And that's what was done. Now that the, I think I've addressed to some degree the trial court's jurisdiction. It, the Homestead order did not deprive the trial court of jurisdiction as asserted in, in appellant's briefing, but in fact, it gave it jurisdiction. And uh, it recognized that the valid device of the trust provided the basis of the court's jurisdiction. And we, and when we brought this action, recognized that we took the, we took the Homestead order and made it ex an exhibit in the case, it's an exhibit to the complaint. That's what, and, and coming out of that, you can see that appellant's collateral estoppel argument also must fail because there's no, although the parties are the same in the two actions, there's no inconsistency between the position taken by the personal representative and the positions taken by the trustee. Nobody was trying to re-litigate the homestead attributes of Mr. Engel's property. The, the homestead order is entirely consistent and incorporated into the trust complaint that underlies this case. Turn just for a moment to the October 1st, 2020 order that is on appeal. Um, contrary to appellant's statements in her briefing, nowhere in the October 1st, 2020 order does Judge Kyle say that he lacks jurisdiction? He recognized that he had jurisdiction by virtue of the Homestead Order. What he does do instead is he number one says, this motion to consolidate is untimely. This case was dismissed with prejudice in 2017. And here it is March 23rd of 2020. And I'm hearing this motion to consolidate. The trial court also points out at length in its order that the case was concluded by way of settlement twice and that a final order and initially that a final order had issued and with no appeal taken. All of these are rational reasons within the bounds of the court's discretion to say, hey, no consolidation here. So I think if you look at the, look at the order and you read it, you will see if the court gave a reasoned opinion within the bounds of its discretion and in light of the facts of this case, very reasonable, as to why there should be no consolidation. Finally, I'd like to just, just touch for a minute and, and I will be brief. Um, there are two settlement agreements here also, your honors. And as I pointed out earlier, appellant gave up her, her claims and waived them twice. She has no claims left. If for no other reason, this appeal cannot succeed because she has no claims. Consolidating a case where, where she's waived and settled her claims. There's nothing there. So for those reasons, Your Honor, I think that uh, this court should deny the appellant's uh, appeal and recognize that trial court acted within its discretion, recognize that appellant has no claims left to pursue and no reason exists to permit consolidation. Thank you, Your Honors. All right, Ms. Ringel, Baker, you have five minutes for rebuttal.
Your microphone's muted. Thank you. In going back to the hearing in the civil court, um, the last hearing, uh, the judge did not justify the non -con the consolidation. And he said only that the probate didn't want it. And a, <clears throat> the other thing item that he said is the case was closed. Um, I argued that it was not because he kept some jurisdiction um, and he conceded that he had written an order in May of 2016 and he would rewrite the order for that particular day to say the case was closed on the day that the hearing happened. Therefore, I was still in <clears throat> the amount of time to file an appeal, which I could not do because he's, he had never, never closed the case. So he finally did. But what I am doing, I'm seeking assistance of the lower probate court to enforce its code as to the appellee's non-compliance with the mandatory requirements of a probate code, the 5401D or the sta state statute of the 733609. In the accounting, um, they filed, there was, a, there was a motion for a full accounting, requesting a full accounting from the appellee. Um, at that same hearing, on the eve of that hearing, the appellee filed their motion to dismiss the case and file a final, a, fin, file a final accounting. The final accounting was not a full accounting. It was barely listed as much of anything. Um, so I never knew what my sister spent for the entire, entire time she was the um, power of attorney or when she was the personal representative. I had received no, and I will emphasize, no accounting whatsoever of my father's accounts, of a re reverse mortgage, of a <clears throat> refinanced re reverse mortgage that ended up to be for one year of care for my father, um, full caretaking to keep him at home where he wanted to be in the house that I designed, um, turned out to be $359,000 for one year of care. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, now, going back to um, the homesteading, yes, they did homestead a property. The property, however, had no inhabitants to the property um, when it was homesteaded. Um, there was no one living there. It was not the property. It was not the homestead of Catherine. I did not object to the homestead because the property had been homesteaded the entire time that I was half owner and that I paid the mortgage and the taxes, half the taxes with my parents for 30 years. So I didn't object to the homestead because I didn't know it was going to be anything different. My understanding of a homesteaded pro property, when it is homesteaded, is outside of the court and the court does not have jurisdiction to take action on a homesteaded property. I objected to that um, to that action. After that action, there was a mediation hearing. And in that mediation hearing, which lasted nine hours, um, I was told I was going to lose most everything that I owed my sister $200,000 for her expenses, never saying how much the reverse mortgage was at that point, which I still did not know. At the end of that mediation agreement, I did sign it because nobody told me I could not sign it. I was told I would lose most everything. You've got about 30 seconds left on your rebuttal, but I'll let you finish your thought. Thank you very much. Um, that mediation agreement, in my understanding through the courts, a mediation agreement 
is held solid by the four corners of the agreement. At the end, and that was done in the civil court. In the, when all of that action was completed to the satisfaction of the appellee, they went back to the probate court to close the case. They took that mediation agreement from the civil case and had a different settlement agreement is, I guess the word is, they didn't use the mediation agreement anymore. And it was not used as the four corners because they learned from, from me uh, and from um, our research that the mediation agreement was actually a detriment to my sister and not to me. So at that point I offered again, so she would not lose money. I offered again to purchase the house. Ms. Ms. Ringel Baker, I, I want to inform you that you are out of time. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you for coming today. I want to thank Mr. Ulrich. And we're going to take a short recess, and then we'll come back and do the last case, okay? 10-minute recess. <laughs>